Let me pray. All right, hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you for tonight. Uh, thank you for your word that uh, is a light to our path. It shows us where we are. It's a lamp into our feet and a light to our path. And it shows us where we're going. It shows us where we stand and what we're headed towards, Father. It also is the truth that makes us free, Father. We ask that you just give us understanding uh, on the things you want us to understand tonight, Father. Uh, give us hearts that can receive it. We bind any devil who try and steal this word out of our hearts in Jesus' name. We thank you for it. Amen. Amen. All right. Let's start with this. Um, now, if you're scared of always, there's going to be a ton of scripture because it's Bible study. There's lots of Bible. Right? It's not preaching study where it's a couple of verses and then you just pound it. This is Bible study. But 1 Thessalonians 5. So I'll just make sure. I'll, I'll, I will write all the scripture up here. First, Thessalonians. And we're going to go to, let's go to verse 23. First Thessalonians 5.23. There we go. sanctify you holy, and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's a big time prayer, and that's a huge revelation. So many religions and cultures have no clue that man is spirit, soul, and body. They think maybe man is a soul, maybe he's a mind, maybe he's some kind of spiritual being, but they don't have this designation. And this is important because each aspect of this has something to do with our salvation. One of them's past, one of them's present, one of them's future. And when we read the Word, there's a lot of passages we run into that if we don't make the distinction, okay, is so he talking about our spirit, soul, or body, we can get really confused about certain things. So let's just start right into it. Um, the first thing we're going to look at uh, is the spirit. We're going to look at something called justification. Now, that's a fancy word, but we use the phrase, it's just as if I never sinned. That's what happens. When you get saved, you accept Jesus as your Savior. It's just as if you've never sinned. That's gone on in your life. Your spirit, soul, body, but that's in your spirit. Your spirit is justified. So you stand before God. Just as if you never sinned. He looks down at you. He's so happy. Because he doesn't see your sin that went on Jesus. So now let's look at a verse with this. Let's go, go to Romans 3.28. Romans 
you've only missed two scriptures. So 1 Thessalonians 5.23, where he's talking about, I pray that God would, you know, you basically your spiritual body mentioned there. And then um, we just turned to Romans 3.28. So we're talking about what happened in our spirit, right? So when we were justified, meaning it's just as if we never sinned, because we're spirit, soul, body. And so we see here in Romans 3.28, Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. So this is the idea, whereas you'll see most religions on the planet, actually not most, every religion on the planet, they get right with their God by doing something. They have to do something. He must be appeased. It doesn't matter. We've got to bag the sticks in the hole like they do in Micronesia, this island kingdom far, far away. Um, you have to do something, whatever it is, right? But for us, it's by faith. It's not what we do. It's what Jesus did for us. Religious people hate this. <laughs> they want to be involved. They want to save themselves. They want something to do. Uh, sorry, you don't get it. There's nothing you can do that makes God okay with you. It's what Jesus did for you. That's why our salvation is a free gift. Also drives religious people crazy. What do you mean God just gives it to you for free? Yes, He does because He loves us. It's because He loves us that He just gives it. He says, look what Jesus did for you. Do you believe it? Yep. That's it. That's where we're believing by faith in what Jesus did for us. It's not what Aaron does that, you know, what could I possibly do to earn heaven? Right? What could I possibly do? That's, you know, because basically if we reject this, we say, no, it's not by faith, it's by works, then we're saying, I know the blood of Jesus is okay, however, what I do is much better. And that's where we're putting ourselves, right? So it's not. We're saying, when we say we're justified by faith, we're going, it's what Jesus did I believe that God said, Jesus dying for me is enough. Hallelujah. Thank you. I don't need to die for me. Jesus died for me. And so then, when I believe it, God says, thank you for accepting my salvation. <laughs> and we are justified. We are just as if we never sinned. So let's turn the page. Romans 4 now. Romans 4, verse 5. And really, when we see in Romans... Romans deals with this whole uh, whole idea. It's really the core. And we'll actually go through, we'll do a, a thing where we go through Romans, just everything, so you will understand it more than anyone you know. <laughs> you will understand it left, right, and center. But Romans 4, verse 5. So we're going to look at Romans 4, verse 5. We see here, again, emphasizing emphasizing this point. But to him that worketh not, that's you and me, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, right? God uh, justified us even when we, were in a, when we were sinners, it says Christ died for us. You know, when we were sinners, when we were wretched, Jesus said, I'm still going to die for you. That's the amazing grace. It's not because we were good that God said, I'll die for you, Aaron. You're having a good day. <laughs> it's like, no, no. You're, the, you're just having a bad day. I'm going to show you about love. I'm going to die for you anyway. And the sins of the whole world. That's amazing, right? But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly. Again, this drives religious people crazy. What do you mean? That guy who was living like a drunk his whole life? You tell him Jesus died for him. He accepts it. He goes to heaven. Uh-huh. Sorry. Because it's not about that man saving himself. It's about Jesus saving him. That's why it's cool. That's what grace is. Right? But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him. That's our job. We're believers. We believe on him that justifies the ungodly. What? His faith is counted for righteousness. Right? Our faith is counted for righteousness. God says it's right between you and me. Let's go back just a couple verses. Let's go to Romans 4.1. And we're just going to read up to 4.5 because we're going to put this in context now. It says, what shall we say then that Abraham our father as pertaining to the flesh hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. 
So right, God told Abraham, Abraham, look up at the stars. Your children are going to be just as numerous as the stars. And Abraham said, well, God, that's quite something. But if you say it, I'll believe it. And God said, really? He said, yeah, I believe it. And God said, all right then. I'm going to take your belief and count it to you as righteousness. God says, you're all right with me because you believe me. I tell you, God loves people that believe him. He really gets mad at people who have unbelief. Like God who is truth, and there's people who when God says something, they say, I don't believe it. That's remarkable. He's truth. If anyone needs to be believed, it's someone who is truth. So look at verse 3, Romans 4, 3. For what say the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Because that's what we're doing. We're believing God. We're believing that God said, Jesus is enough for my sin. And I'm saying, God, you're right. I believe that Jesus is enough for me. And then God says, now you and I, Aaron, we're okay. Because you believe what I said. And look at verse 4. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. Meaning, if, I, if it was me, I'm going to save myself. Uh, I, I gotta do all these things, then God owes me heaven. Because it's work. I'm working. God's gotta pay me. Right? But it's not. It's a grace. It's a free gift. Right? If someone comes, shows up at your birthday party and gives you a gift, what do you have to do? You gotta work that off for the next year? Thanks, thanks for the transformer, Jimmy, but it's gonna be like two months of mowing my lawn. You know? No. Anytime someone gives you a gift, if you got to work for it, it ain't a gift. But if it is a gift, you don't work for it. It's just freely given. And we really have to, like it seems like we're hitting this a lot, but it's some people, because of the nature of man, and you look, every religion in the world, if it's Buddhism, we'd be sitting at the mountaintop spinning prayer wheels. Got to do something. We got to do something. But with us, it's that Jesus actually did it all. It doesn't mean we don't do things because of that. But as far as our salvation is concerned, us getting to heaven, it's not based on how good I, you know, I had a good day, I'm going to heaven. I had a bad day, I'm going to hell. I had a good, no, no. It's because Jesus did it for me. And if our faith is not on him, then our faith really isn't in God. If it's faith still on Aaron, I'm in trouble. Because <laughs> even on my best day, it's not worth heaven. You know, it's just not. But Jesus, if I put my faith on what he did, that's it. That's what we want. Uh, so look at verse, we're going to read the next verse, verse uh, 4, 6. Look at, even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. Imputeth is just a word that means he puts it on your account. Right? He puts it on your account. God says, look, basically here's what happened. G how G what's on Jesus' account and how G him and God are just perfect together. God says, I'm going to put your sin, like for me, I'm going to put your sin, Aaron, on Jesus' account, and I'm going to put his righteousness on your account. That's amazing. That's amazing. Jesus is going to take my sin, I'm going to take his righteousness, and people say, I don't want that. <laughs> that's remarkable when people say, that's free, and it's free. I don't need to crawl on my knees up a mountain, <laughs> you know, I don't need to, like, like uh, remember when uh, that one uh, Syrian military general had leprosy and he came to Elisha because he heard, oh, there's a prophet there, who, he heals lepers and maybe his God will heal me, and then Elisha doesn't even come out to see him, he just says, yeah, he sends a servant, says, yeah, go dip in the Jordan seven times. And the guy gets mad. He's like, what do you mean? No, let's, let, we're out of here. And then his servant says, hey, if he had told you to do some great thing, wouldn't you have done that? Right? And it's true, because that's the nature of man. We're like, oh, I want to do this great thing. So then people go, oh, look, he saved himself. You know, look what I did. Ha ha, I get heaven. And everyone in heaven applauds because I saved myself. No, it's what Jesus did. And look at verse 6 there. Even, right, even as David also described it, the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputed, right? God puts on your account righteousness without works. You didn't do anything to get it. God says, we're cool because of what Jesus did, saying, blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. And then look at verse 8. 
Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Meaning he will not put sin on your account anymore. That's amazing. He will not put it on your account. That's amazing. Why? Because all my sins were put on Jesus. He took not just half of my sins. Not just the ones that were sort of okay. <laughs> he took them all. He took the sins of the whole world. What a remarkable salvation we have here. It really is, right? Alright, so I want to go to... Let's go to Titus, chapter 3. Titus... Chapter 3, and we want to look at verse 5 to 7. Titus chapter 3, 5 to 7. See, and this is this is all we're looking at the spirit part of you. This is all going on in your spirit. Because you, because we go, wow, I'm so perfect in my spirit. God sees me as perfect. I'm totally justified. I'm right with God. Then why do I still struggle with stuff? Well, that's because we've got a soul, too. <laughs> and we'll deal with that in a sec. That's where the work happens. That's where we're, you know, crucifying the flesh and, you know, doing all that fun stuff of growing. But this isn't about growing. This is about, this is what Jesus did for us. That's what he did. Now, this is our response. As we grow, as we mature, that happens in our soul. All right. So let's look at uh, Titus 3, 5 to 7. I'm going to read from verse 4. But after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared. I love that, right? The kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to His mercy, He saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. So let's just break this down a little bit. So he said, right, the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared towards us. Again, not by works of righteousness, which we have done. It's not, God didn't decide to like us because man all of a sudden was in a good spot. You know, Rome was sort of like the peak of evil for mankind. When Rome's on the scene, the world was not in a good spot. You know, when you're openly crucifying criminals on crosses along roads, the justice system's a little askew. Right? They're like, it was a pretty evil world 2,000 years ago. Like, even, even we've got MMA fighting. We don't have yet on, you know, where you're tuning in watching people get eaten by lions on TV. That was wrong. <laughs> yeah. So there was like a bit of a peak of sin when Jesus appeared there. Right? So, but it's not that, you know, he didn't show up and say, I'm going to save them because they're so good. No. But it's according to his mercy. Now it sounds like we're just belaboring this, but we have to get, we have to get this because everything we're going to build is built on what He did for us, right? According to His mercy, He saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which He shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. And then look at verse 7. That being justified by His grace, so we're justified, we should be made heirs. And that's where we get through into the soul part. Now it's not just about, okay, so we're justified, great. We're, so what is it now? Now it's about inheritance. Now it's about growing in grace. Now it's about getting all the really cool stuff God has for His children. And that's what we want. We want to see things like the gifts of the Spirit. We want to see things like miracles. But those things have to sit on the reality of what God did for us. Otherwise, we're going to think, oh, if I need to see a miracle, I have to be doing good. It has to be because I'm a good person that God will work miracles. No, no, no. You're justified because of what Jesus did. So we have to be, that has to be settled. You know, that has to be settled. Um, otherwise, we're going to, we're going to believe that it's just, the only time we're going to see power of God or God's going to move is because I basically had a good day as a Christian. 
And that's just not the case. He moves because he's merciful. He moves because he loves people. That's why he moves. And then we can see, even when you're having a bad day, God can still heal people through you. Miracles can still happen. Because you've gotten to the point where you realize, oh, it's not based on me. It's based on what he's done. Now, it doesn't mean you should still live a reckless life. We will grow up. But the part that you know people often struggle with is trying to be good. And you don't have to in terms of heaven. Jesus was our goodness that we exchanged our sin for. So we are justified by his grace. Again, it's something he did. It's not anything we did. And now what this saves us from is, is the penalty of sin. The penalty of sin. Right? The penalty of sin is death. So when you're justified, when you've received that justification by faith, the penalty of sin is not on you. It passed to Jesus. He died, and you live. He died, and you live. Alright. Now this is the fun one. Usually, when people are talking about you know their growth and all that stuff and what they're going through, this is what we're dealing with. We're dealing with our soul. Because our spirit, when it's born again, the Bible tells us you're one spirit with the Lord. We'll actually look at a thing where we go through like 40 different things that like see, you just got born again. And you're just thinking, okay, what happened? So many really cool things happen. Boom, instant mansion in heaven, you become an heir, God's working with you as a king. You're like, I don't feel like a king. But you is. Because <laughs> so many cool things have happened. And you don't even know. <laughs> and it's, it's pretty awesome. But this is how we get to see the cool stuff. You know, power of God. And all, you know, the whole world opens up. It's through this process. And, and that just means as we walk. That's really as we walk with God daily. Right? This is strictly, this is what Jesus did for us. Boom. That's in our spirit. Now, this is where the rubber meets the road. This is our daily walk. This is our deciding to walk with God. And this is called sanctification. Let's go to John, the Gospel of John, chapter 17 and verse 17. John 17, 17. A picture I like to uh, to use here is um, like when Joshua, when Israel left the land of Egypt, right? They came out by the blood of the Lamb. That's a picture of the justification. But now when they're taking the promised land, that's a picture of sanctification. You're taking the land. And for us, basically, that's what our soul is. We're inheriting our soul. We're taking the land of our soul, of our inheritance, and the things God's promised us. But John 17, 17 says, Sanctify them. So to sanctify means to set something apart, to make it more holy. So that's all you're doing. You're, just, you're setting yourself more apart. And I, usually we talk about things like, okay, I was in more prayer, I'm in the Word more. That's true, you're just taking your time and giving it to God. At the end of the day, that's the only choice man has. You have one decision you make every day, what to do with your time. That's the only decision you're actually making. In each moment, what am I going to do with my time? And the more of our time we give God, the more of this process, right, happens in our life, where our soul becomes just like our spirit. Our, in, our, in your spirit, you're perfect. Right? It's almost like a, when you take a photograph, and remember back in the day when we had film? <laughs> remember that so many moons ago? Where you take a photograph, and you actually had to get film. Film, it used to be this thing, and it's, it's coming these cameras, and it was like on this strip, and you'd have to develop it. I know it's kind of like, <laughs> before your time. <laughs> right? And that's what, see, so you take the picture, boom, the picture's perfect, but then you have to be developed. 
And that's what's going on in our soul. We're being developed into who we are in Christ, right? So we have this full-on, perfect, mature Jesus, you know, we're one spirit with the Lord in our spirit, but now that has to develop, that has to come out into our soul, and that's this process. So one of the ways we do it, like, God, okay, I want to get into this, I want to see the gifts of the spirit, I want to see the power of God in my life, how do I do that, right? So everything that's in our spirit, how do we move that into our soul? Well, that's process number one. Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. When you're in this thing, it automatically cleanses you. It automatically affects your soul and prepares it, makes it like fertile ground for the Lord to work in your life. That's just one of the things it can do. That's pretty awesome. It's The Word just does it by itself. Let's go to Acts 26.18. Acts 26, 18. But this is the this is really what we get into. We get into an inheritance. Acts 26, verse 18. This is something Jesus said directly to Paul. Turn right in the Gospel of John. <laughs> if you hit Romans, you respond to Paul. All right. Uh, so this is Jesus talking to Paul. It's something he told him he's going to do, to open their eyes, talking with the Gentiles, to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins, right, that's this, forgiveness of sins, they're justified, you're right with God, all's good, your sins are taken care of, but it doesn't just stop there, and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Right? So, inheritance among them that are sanctified. Right? And that's a, that's a big deal. Because there's... The whole Christian goal is not just about making heaven. You know, if it was just about making heaven, like, you know, when you got saved, poof, we're gone. It's not like, like it should happen. You know, someone gets saved, poof, they vanish off to heaven. Right? If that was the goal. Because you achieved it. You achieved it. You got saved. That gets you to heaven. But this process now gets you inheritance. That's where we, we see. We're going to see some really cool things. Next week, we're going to look at cool stuff. Um, we're going to see things like crowns. There's, there's a few really interesting things that we get as we mature and grow. And that's what that has to do. right? You get an inheritance through your sanctification. It's not just about getting heaven. You can have a far more excellent time in heaven as we just give ourselves to the Lord. But you really have to see that. Right? It says, and inheritance, Acts 26, 18, look at that last part. And inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. That's not talking about your standing in the family. No, you're in the family. It's talking about what you now inherit being in the family. Right? Just like, you know, Ethan's 10, or he's 11 now, right? But at his age, though he's in the family, right? He's born in the family. I can't deny him. He's my son. He's in the family. There's certain things he can't get till he's mature. I'm not going to give him the geese to the caravan. <laughs> All y'all would be running. <laughs> like, There's Ethan! <laughs> It'd be crazy, right? And so God wants to give us certain things. But we don't get them until we mature, until we grow up in Christ, right? So that's the thing. So this is our position, right? This is us being born into the family of God. Now this is, now what are we going to do that we're in the family? We're going to grow up. We want to inherit the things that the Father has for us. Because like I said, it's not, otherwise, why write this, like, why, this is, 
This is not just about how to get to heaven. That's, we can do that in one verse. <laughs> Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. There you go, right? This is about so much more. This is about inheritance. This is about promises. This is about taking the land, seeing revival, and seeing people saved and delivered and set free, and God using you to do it. That's the thing. And that's what we get into. When we get more sanctified, more set apart, the more God can use us. Because the more our soul is submissive to our spirit. So then God can really start to move. Let's look at Philippians. Right? This is like, it's like a sword drill. <laughs> Philippians 2.12. <laughs> the first person gets a candy. <laughs> Philippians 2.12. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Philippians 2.12. I, I am going to bring, I'm going to bring candies on one. I'm going to bring licorice. Whoever gets there first gets candies. Gets a lot of candy. Uh, exactly. <laughs> Philippians 2.12. And I want you, this is a huge thing. And again, right, because... This is what Jesus did for you. What Jesus did for you puts you in the family of God. He says, there's my son, there's my daughter. Now, it's about what are we doing for him. This is not about our salvation, though, as far as, like, are we getting to heaven. This is about that, because it's based on what Jesus did. Now, what this is about is now, what kind of life are we going to live? Is, is God going to deal with me as someone who's mature, who he can trust, who he can put into ministry, who he can... You know, send to another country and preach a gospel. What this is this allows him to move things through us. So Philippians 2.12. Oh, what did I write there? Oh yeah. Yeah, you know that's a that's an L. That's an L. That's an L. I should have left more space. Um, he says, Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only. But now, much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Notice it doesn't say work for. All right? It doesn't say work for. It says work out. You've, now that you've got this salvation, use it! Right? Use it! <laughs> you've got the muscles. Work them out. Do something with them. Lift some wood, like Calvin's been doing. Lift wood, buddy. <laughs> right? But that's a big deal, right? It doesn't say work for, it's work out. Work out. Because our salvation's there, we've got it, now let's bring it out. Right? There's a, a song, it's with joy shall you draw water from the wells of salvation. What a neat thing, with joy shall you draw water from the wells of salvation. Because the salvation is there. It's already sitting there in your spirit. Full on, beautiful rivers of living water. We need to start moving them out. Right? And as we are in the word of God, it cleanses us. And even as we're, we talk about, which we'll look at later, not, not tonight, but the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And you know, speaking in tongues and gifts of the spirit. That starts moving the power of God from our spirit through our soul. And eventually, out the body. Because that's, you know, say you lay hands on the sick, what are you doing? Well, the power is moving from your spirit, through your soul, out your body, into that person. And as we're more sanctified, and we you know if we're in the Word a lot, if we're praying a lot, we're going to find that the spirit can easily move through our soul. But if all we're doing is Netflixing, <laughs> I step on any toes. I'm not saying a little honey's not bad. Netflix isn't evil. You can watch things. But just don't make that your God. Don't make it your idol. Don't spend more time with next but than you do with Jesus. You can if you want, though. You can if you want. But if you really want to see what's in your spirit come out, you just got to put some more time in with the Lord. And that's it. At the end of the day, it's really, you know, God's like, whatever you want. You're still in the family. You know, you're still in the family. But if you want him to use you mightily, then you can do some things where he can do that. It's not up to him. It's actually up to you. Right? Which is kind of interesting. That's that R word I've been talking about this last week. The responsibility. Right? Where we, okay Lord. Right? He doesn't say I'll lay hands on the sick. He says you will lay hands on the sick. Responsibility. But, right? Let's, let's finish to uh, verse 13. 
Philippians 2.13. What does it say? For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. That's pretty cool. And this is where we have to realize this. Even though we're making decisions, ultimately we can't change our we can't change our hearts. Right? If I just decide to do religious things, if this just becomes, okay, Aaron said read the Bible. I'm just gonna get up in the morning and read the Bible. Okay, I read a chapter time. Aaron said I need to pray for, you know, five minutes every hour. Okay, we shot on Poggy about that and then, you know, okay, done. If it just becomes a religious thing, guess what it's gonna produce? Nothing at all. <laughs> Nothing at all. That's why we have this second verse in here. Verse 13, it says, For it's God which worketh in you, both to will and to do, of his good pleasure. So you're not just doing this by yourself. You're doing it with God. God's working all this in you. Right? So when you sit down in the Word, and you're opening it, okay, be, let Lord show me something in your Word. I want to sanctify, I want to set myself apart, and let God work on you. Don't just do it as a religious exercise. Otherwise, everything we do becomes just dead. <laughs> Dead, dead, dead. If you don't want dead, you want life. You want life. Right? So even when we pray, we want to make sure that, you know, we're not just, like, come on. We all know many religions that have dead, repetitive prayers. It's not prayer. It's not chance. When we're praying, we're speaking to the Lord. We're spending time with Him. We're communing with Him. And remember, half of prayer is listening. I know usually we pray and run. <laughs> we need to pray and stay and let Him answer. He really will answer us. But we have to see, it's God working in us. So even the sanctification process, yes, it's our will. You have to decide to read your Bible. You have to decide to pray. God will never override your will. But once you do that, realize you're working with Him. It's still not just you. And, if you, and that's the problem. If we think it's just us, it becomes a dead religion. Right? If we go, okay, here's, here's how we run church. We're going to do three fast songs, two slow songs. Uh, you know, I'm going to get up and preach something fiery, call people to salvation, and dismiss everyone. And if we say that's how we do it every Sunday, and we're not open to be led by the Spirit, maybe the Lord wants to change it up, then what we'll have is an absolutely dead thing, and it will just die a brutal death. <laughs> and we'll all go, what was wrong? But Because it's just a dead form. And that's the thing, even like Pentecostalism, like we hear stories of amazing things 100 years ago or 50 years ago, or, but there's always revivals in the past, and then people hold on to how they did things. They get caught in the form. And we have to let the, really, the river of life be able to flow as it needs to flow. Like, who knows? Sometimes maybe God wants to finish the service with the music. I don't know. But he may one time. <laughs> and it doesn't mean we go, oh, let's just do it kind of chaotic. No, there's nothing wrong with planning. But if the Spirit says, hey, let's sing some songs to close it up, go with the Spirit. You never know, right? So we have to be uh, allowing room for God to be working with us, even when we're going through the sanctification process. Let's look at one more verse for this section. Romans 15, 16. Romans 15, 16. <clears throat> process of the Holy Spirit. 
That's his job. His job is to show up and work on you. <laughs> he is going to just show up and work on you. That's what it even talks about in Jude, verse 20, where it talks about building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Right? You're building up yourself. You're sanctifying yourself. You're edifying yourself in the Holy Ghost. So when we talk about God working all these things in us, He's doing it by the Holy Spirit in us. Right? So yes, we have God in our spirit, but also, right, we want Him in our soul. We want to see the whole process given over to the Lord. And then we saw this was the penalty of sin. This frees us from the power of sin. So when we're saved, you're justified, you stand before Jesus, or you stand before the Father, just as if you never sinned. You're all good with God. It's not anything you did. It's strictly by faith. It's what Jesus did. This frees you from the penalty of sin. And as we know, the Bible says, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is freedom, justification, and that's what we get as a free gift. But now this is us. And it delivers us from the power of sin. If you see people that are struggling, people get saved. You know, a lot of people get here. <laughs> we have a revival, lots of this. <laughs> lots of newborn. But then it's like, okay, now we've got to go. We've got to move forward. Because a lot of people will still struggle with the power of sin in their life. Addictions. You know, they go, well, I got saved. Why am I still addicted, addicted to this? Because now you've got to get sanctified. Now your soul needs to change. You change your spirit. Awesome, you're in the family. Hallelujah. But now you've got to get sanctified. Get in the Word. Get in prayer. Get baptized in the Holy Ghost. And then the power that sin has over our lives can break off. And that's usually what we see. When we see the gifts of the Spirit, we see healing, we see the power of God. When people you know, get slain in the Holy Ghost, that's Him working on their soul to set them free of things in their soul. And I, we've heard countless stories of, oh, I was addicted to this, and then wham, the Holy Ghost says, hey, how are you doing? And then they get up and, and they get delivered, right? Because that thing breaks off their soul, and that's a work of the Holy Ghost. They couldn't do it themselves, right? It's God working in them to will and to do for His good pleasure, right? So that's awesome. Then that sets us free from the power of sin. So just practical things. We go, I'm struggling with this thing in my life. God, I'd like to not do it, whatever it is. Well, we can spend time in His Word. That's just a very practical thing. Again, let's not make it religious. Okay, you just gotta spend time in the Word. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no! It's just, it just won't happen. God will just, gotta wait in heaven while you're doing that and say, yeah, yeah. Alright. Whenever you're done being religious. You know? Because He's in no hurry. He's in no hurry. He's the most unhurried individual ever. <laughs> But we can work with him, right? We can work with him. We can get baptized in the Holy Ghost. We can let, you know, that's why even when you're in a church, if you're in it, you have to be in a church where the Holy Ghost is allowed to move. Like we saw. That's why we love it when Brother George is preaching and, and James and, you know, when we're having those more preaching times and the Holy Ghost can just do what he wants and grab hearts and change people's lives. Uh, we see him working there in the soul. And that's what we want to see. If we don't see that, if we don't, if we go, to a church and it's just dead. You know, they're just, hallelujah. <laughs> yeah, I tell you, God is, God is waiting. Waiting for them to let him in. Waiting. He loves them. I know, right? It's like, he loves them. They're still his children. But he's at the door saying, would you let me do something? You know? Would you let me do something? Are you done being religious yet? But, uh, yeah, that's the thing. And, it's, and, the, and that's why you see that, that kind of religious spirit we talk about. Um, anytime Jesus would heal, or like if he'd heal on the Sabbath, you know, they'd get upset. That religious devil gets upset. Why? Because it's, it's the Holy Ghost movement. Right? That religious devil wants to keep people in bondage. And when the Spirit's moving, it's time to set them free. Like when Jesus healed that woman who was bowed over, and Jesus said, this woman, she's a daughter of Abraham, Shouldn't she be healed? She's been like this for 18 years. Satan's bound her 18 years. And you, you're loosing your donkey and your horse, you know, to feed them on the Sabbath. And shouldn't she be set free? 
It's an amazing thing, right? But that religious spirit wants to keep people in bondage. It loves a, a, a religious service. It, it doesn't mind. We can do that. We can come in here and have religion all day long. And that spirit will leave us alone. But as soon as someone gets healed, or someone's getting saved, the Holy Spirit starts moving. Oh, man. The snakes will come out then. Absolutely. But it's good. If, if people are not... If, if the devil's not coming against it, you're really probably dead. You're probably dead. You know, because he, he doesn't need to come against you. But if he is coming against you, that's a sign that the Holy Spirit's moving. Because that's the only, honestly, the devil's not afraid of Christians. He's afraid of Christians to allow the Holy Spirit to move. Right? That's who he's afraid of. And so we want to let the Lord move in our midst to change people and grab people's hearts uh, so that they can be set free. So let's look at this last part here. Now the body. And then we'll tie it all together. Boom. So we've got justification for the spirit, sanctification or the process of being set apart for the soul, and then the body, which is future. We do get a taste of it now. From time to time, uh, glorification. Let's go to, we'll stay in Romans, we'll go to Romans 13. Romans 13, verse 11. Some people will use this verse. No, you're not saved yet. You've got to say, you know, our fathers, and you've got to say this, or you've got to climb that mountain and, not, and burn this incense to that saint, or you've got to, you know, you've got to do all these things to see salvation isn't here yet. But no, this is talking about this because there's three, right? This is our position in the family of God. This is our state as we progress, and then it's talking about the future glorification of the body, right? Then when He comes in this thing. It is changed in the twinkling of an eye. Hallelujah. The sound of the trumpet. And that's what's coming. That's the future salvation. When someone's going to come looking for you, they ain't going to find you. They ain't going to find you. Because he has come and saved that body. Though it is changed in the twinkling of an eye, but it's a bodily salvation. And this saved us. I'm just going to put it here. I don't know if it's down there. But this saves us from the presence of sin. Forgive that spelling of the word presence. And that, because that's the ultimate thing. Right, right now, in our spirit, you're saved from the penalty of sin. You can't die if you want to die in your spirit. Right? Obviously, our bodies can still die. But you're saved from the penalty of sin. Jesus died for you. You don't have to die for your sin. He died for your sin. Now, what's going on? Now you're working out your salvation. Now you're freed from the power of sin in your life, addictions, problems, issues, da 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 da. You know, all the things are, you know, we deal with as little kids. We grow out of that. And now we're looking at the future glorification where we're going to be free from the presence of sin. You're just not going to have to deal with all the junk. There's a day coming with all the crap, <laughs> you know, all this garbage in the world, and our political leaders scheming and plotting against everybody is done. Hallelujah. That's coming. And if we don't have that hope, none of this matters. Right? If we don't have this hope that we're going to be with him, that he's coming back, what, what's the point? If he ain't coming back, just eat, drink, tomorrow you die. But he is coming. We are living forever with him. Because we have this hope, we do this. Because we know this, you know, it may not look like this, but I know bodily, in, in whatever 
form it is, you know, pretty fantastic looking. I'm going to stand before him one day. And he's going to say, so Aaron, what did you do with that awesome salvation I gave you? <laughs> then I'm going to be like, either crying <laughs> and making excuses, you know, or saying at least a couple of things, maybe, you know. But that is why we do all this, because he's coming back. He is coming back. Like Paul says, Paul says, if in this life only we have hope, we are of all men most miserable. Right? If it's just this life, 70 years, 80 years, be nice, be religious, that's it. Nope, it's not. It's because we go on forever. We have an eternal, glorified body, and we're going on for zillions and zillions of years, whether the devil likes it or not. That's what I like. So let's look at a really cool verse about this. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 15. Now there's a, there's a bunch of neat things here. Uh, I'll try and zoom in on a couple so your ears don't get too tired. So let's read from verse... Um, Let's read from verse, well, let's do right where we were. Verse 19. 1 Corinthians 15, 19. 1 Corinthians 15, 19. And we'll go to where we go to. So this is that verse where Paul says, If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. That's so true. Because then, like, what's the point in just doing stuff and being nice? And that's where the world wants it. The world says, okay, Christians, you just do your little thing, have your little religious experiment, but there's no point to your existence. Liars! <laughs> there is. And our king is coming, and he's going to deal with you very shortly. He will deal with you directly. <laughs> so let's read from... Um, from 19, we'll just read, read a couple verses here. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. Meaning he went up before everyone else went up, the others that had died. Uh, for since by man came death, right, by Adam, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so we all got this lovely present from Adam and Eve, great granny and grandpa. Hallelujah. Thank you. <laughs> There's going to be a long line in heaven to talk to them. <laughs> long line. <laughs> and I, don't, I don't know. I don't know if everyone's going to be happy. Probably. As in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. That's obviously not talking about our spirit or our soul. That's talking about our bodies. So even if you die and this body gets buried in Christ, it's going to be made alive. It gets raised up a brand new, indestructible, eternal, glorified body, impervious to sin, right? And that's the big thing. It is delivered from the presence of sin. Sin won't be able to penetrate this. You'll never get a cold. You'll never get a sniffle. Nothing. You're just going to be pretty awesome. So let's keep going here. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ in his coming. Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and all power. That, in verse 24 there, that is what the world leaders are terrified of. Jesus having put down all rule and authority and power. Because they like their rule, they like their authority, and they like their power. But Jesus is going to come and just step on them a little bit. And say, no, thank you very much. I'm the king of kings, you're not. And we're going to run this place for a thousand years, if you don't mind. But he's, he, he won't ask. <laughs> he won't ask. So now I want to look at... Which ones did you read? That, we looked at verses... Um, so 1 Corinthians 15, we read from 19 to 24. And I'm just going to throw this verse in. We're not talking about healing. We'll do some really good teaching on healing and praying for the sick and all that stuff. Um, probably Sunday night. 
But 1 Corinthians 15, 26. We have to see death as an enemy. There's a weird thing when people see death as a friend. And it's not your friend. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. That's why we pray for the sick. That's why we pray for the sick. Death is an enemy, not a friend. We say, no death, you can't have them, be healed in Jesus' name. That's, that's what we're fighting when we pray for the sick. Because if someone continues to be sick, they'll be dead. Right? So we are fighting and we're dealing with death when we pray for the sick. But uh, I want to get to this. Let's look at the right, we're looking at the body, we're looking at glorification, we're looking at resurrection. So let's go to verse 35. And this is probably the best portion of scripture dealing with the resurrection of the body. 1 Corinthians 15, uh, sorry, verse 35. But some men will say, how are the dead raised up, and with what body do they come? It's a valid question. Okay, I'm going to get a new body. How, how so? <laughs> right? Thou fool, that which thou sowest is not quick and except it die. So then Paul gives an example of grain. Right? And that which thou sowest, you don't sow the body that shall be, but bare grain. It may chance of wheat or some other grain. Like if I put a little kernel of corn in the ground, we sow that, I'm not going to get a big kernel of corn. I'm going to get a stalk and some ears and some cobs in those ears that have those kernels in it. Right? The, what we sow is small compared to what it becomes. So Paul's giving us a really neat thing. He's saying, look, I know this thing's going to go into the ground, but what comes out is going to be so much better. No, you can't get another one of these. You're going to get, again, something eternal, indestructible, powerful, impervious to sin, impervious to anything. Right? But look at this. Verse 38. But God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him, and to every seed his own body. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there's one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another of fishes, another of birds. There are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial, right? things out there in the heavenlies, in space, there's earth, things on the earth, but the glory of the celestial is one, the glory of the terrestrial is another. There's one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. For one star differeth from another star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. Now we're talking about that glorified body, right? It is sown in corruption... <coughs> It is raised in incorruption. Yeah, that person may have died, it got sick and died, so it went into the ground in corruption, but it is, no, that's not how it comes up. It doesn't come out how it went into the ground. Right? When Grandma goes into the ground, when Jesus pulls her up, she doesn't look like Grandma. She looks like her perfect self. Right? We assume somewhere around 33-ish, that's what we all talk about. You know, whatever that perfect age is, the eternal age... But that's, you know, that's how we understand it. I remember uh, a fellow we stayed with when we were in Texas, and his father had died, and that's how he appeared. He appeared younger, because uh, he, uh, after his, his father had died, uh, his name was Harold. Harold opened his eyes one day, and his dad standing at the foot of his bed, and he's pointing at his grave, and he could see like an open vision, his father's grave. And his father was telling him, he said, that's not real. This is real. That's not real when he was just gone. And that's absolutely true. Right? That grave that we go down into is not your reality. Your reality is this. That you have a new body. And even in the Bible it calls it a house. Which is funny, right? It, it's your house. That's going to be glorified. That you're going to be completely free from any presence of the sin. It will not be able to touch you. It is raised, see, verse 42, it is raised in incorruption. Nothing can corrupt it. It's impervious to anything. Impervious. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. I find that very interesting. How many Christians have been sown in dishonor? Like burned at the stake or beaten them for their faith in all these different countries? Right? They've stood for their faith, they've preached, the people have killed them. They go into the ground in dishonor. But God says, I'm going to raise them in glory. That's awesome. Right? So many missionaries died in the middle of nowhere, forgotten, eaten by crocodiles, whatever, you know. Sown in dishonor. Just, there's no honor in that death. Yet God says, I'm going to raise it in glory. 
That's awesome. What, a, what an awesome thing. It's sown in weakness. Right? Oh, they were so weak when they died. But it's raised in power. What a thing. So we're getting an idea of this body you're getting. One, it's incorruptible. It is powerful. It is glorious. Meaning, glorious is simply a word that actually means there's light coming out of it. Right? The word glow is in it. Glory. The glory of the moon, the glory of the sun. There's a light coming out of it. Just like when John looked at Jesus in Revelation, his face shone like the sun in its strength, there's a light coming out of it. Right? It is sown a natural body, it's raised a spiritual body. So it's very much like we get the idea when Jesus was raised from the dead. Yeah, guess what? He could eat. He ate food with them, he ate on the beach with them, but yet he could travel through walls like it's nobody's business. <laughs> they shut the door and he's like, hey boys, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Doors don't matter. You know, it's spiritual. It's still a body, right? It's not like cloud. It's still a body it could eat, but it doesn't need that food. But it could still just enjoy the things of life. It's a very interesting body you're heading towards. It's very interesting, right? There is a natural and there is a spiritual. As it's written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit, or a life-giving spirit. A life-giving spirit. And we just got a couple more verses here, so we'll leave that one. But that's just a good thing to go over when you're just even thinking about the resurrection of the dead. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, that last chunk there, is so good. Just to see it. Because you see the body's going to be glorious, it's going to be incorruptible, it's going to be powerful, it's going to be spiritual. It's still a body, though. It's not some transient, weird thing. It's still physical. Jesus could eat. Right? But it's just impervious. So let's just go to 1 John 3, verse 2. 1 John 3, 2. This may be our last verse. First John 3, 2. And yeah, we'll probably, we'll finish with verse 3. I'm going to read from 1, but we'll look at 3, 2. That's kind of the main one with that. It says, Behold, so 1 John 3. Turn left at Revelation back. Four books. <laughs> Behold, I'll read from verse 1, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. And that's a huge deal, because what we're talking about, we're talking about some pretty wild things. And we'll get into it. There's, I find about 40 different things that happen to you when you get saved. And I'm sure there's a ton more, but I've got 40 specific ones. And, and to the world, they don't care. They don't care. But for you, you have a reality that is just beyond anything they can imagine. But it tells us right, the world doesn't know you along those lines. Because they didn't know Jesus along those lines. They saw Jesus and just, oh yeah, that's the carpenter. Right? We know his brothers and sisters are here. Who does he think he is? That's what people will say about us. <laughs> so we just have to sort of accept that. But look at verse uh, 2. Right, beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, right, talking about our bodies being glorified, it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know, see, we're not wondering, right, oh, I don't know what's going to happen. No, I, we know, right, we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. That's pretty awesome, right? So even if, if he comes when we're still alive, you're going to go, ah, poof, and instantly be like him with that glorified body, because you're going to see him, and your natural body is going to say, I'm out of here. <laughs> and then instantly that spiritual body is going to come forth. And then Paul says, in the twinkling of an eye, we will be changed. And this corruption 
where it puts on Ingram and just gets swallowed up by that new body. That's going to be pretty cool. Pretty interesting stuff, right? But it says, we know when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. No veil, no prayer closet. There's Jesus, there's you. Boom, new body, new life, into it. This is just going to be awesome. And then this is why. Remember I was saying, without this, we don't have this. There's just no point. And it's true. If he's not coming back, if we're not getting out of here, if it's just be nice and deal with the world, but when you die, there's nothing for you beyond the grave. That's horrible. <laughs> that's horrible. And that's not God. God's like, no, I got tons for you beyond the grave. I got tons. You got an inheritance. You got crowns. You got a mansion. You got stuff to do on earth, he says. He put you in charge of cities for the thousand years. There's lots of cool stuff that we can do. But look at verse 3, 1 John 3, 3, right? So if we have this hope that he's coming back, I can be with him, I'm getting a glorified body, incorruptible, no, nothing, any devil or sin is going to be able to touch me. This is why every man that hath this hope in him purifies himself. So that's why we go through the sanctification process. Right? That's why we're doing this. Because when he comes back, I want him to I want him to be as pleased with me as, I, as he possibly can be. You know, I want him to say, I really like what you did with the time I gave you. Right? If I don't do anything, am I still a kid? Yeah. I'm still in the family. I'm still in the family. But I won't get the crowns. <laughs> Right? There's a crown for those that, Paul says, who love his appearing. There's Christians who don't care. They just like, I don't care if Jesus comes or not. You ain't going to get that crown. Are you still in the family? Yes, you're born. But don't expect all the goodies. Right? <laughs> you ain't going to get it. <laughs> but for those of us who want the goodies, <laughs> we're going to say, yes, Lord. Let's get in the Word. Let's get in the... You know, let the Holy Ghost move in our meetings. Let's pray in the, in the Spirit. Because we know He's coming. And I, if I'm in the ground, I'm coming out with a new body. Or if I see Him, instantly I'm getting a new body. And then Paul says, forever we'll be with the Lord. Forever we'll be with the Lord. So then this is just general overview, right? So then this is our... You get saved, your spirit is one spirit with the Lord. You're free from the penalty of sin. You ain't dying. Uh, it's awesome. You stuck going to heaven. It's by faith. It's not by works. There's nothing you can do. Otherwise, Jesus would have just stayed in heaven. If he said, Aaron, you just live a really good life, and I'll just hang out up here. I mean, you know? No, he had to come and die, and I put my faith in what he did. And then we have, this is where the work is, and this is where people struggle. But if we are struggling with the power of sin, things working in our life against us, what do I do, God? You know, basically the will of God for my life. Spend time in the Word. Spend time in prayer. Spend time with God's ministers. Let them pray for you. Uh, and this is, will go much easier. That's, this is where the war is, right? This is where you're taking the land. And this is where the devil's fighting you. He doesn't want you to grow up in, in Jesus. He wants you to... He doesn't mind if you're even a Christian. He'll still try and kill you. <laughs> you know, but if you're just a baby Christian who doesn't want to grow up, he likes those. He likes those. He can shut those churches down all day long. All day long. But once you start hungering for the things of God, let's go on, let's take the land, da, 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 it's going to be warfare. But you just have to realize, it's okay, God will win. God will win. We'll, we'll look at some real specific warfare stuff, which will melt your mind. It's pretty awesome. <laughs> Uh, but it's, yeah, God will win. And then we know, why are we doing this? Because he's coming back. Because we have an eternity ahead. Because we're getting these new bodies. And we're never going to die. And we don't have to worry about a thing when he comes. So that's uh, spirit, soul, body. Just an overview in terms of the salvations. Any questions about any of these things? <laughs> So that happened to me after I was born again. Mm -hmm. I still, I was still swearing. Yes. And I was sanctified later on. Exactly right, because that's it. You like what Jesus did. Awesome. 
great, but now, <laughs> now you're working out what he did, right? And that's like the idea of like working clay. Jesus is like, okay, like you've given himself your life. You know, there you go, you're saved. Here's my life, Lord. And he says, all right, and then he starts molding it. And we go, ah! <laughs> you know, but he's making us into something he can use. Right? He's molding us. He's like, I want to fill you with something amazing and then pour you out to all kinds of different people. Right? But i got to work on you. Yeah, my... This has been real fun for me. <laughs> That's my wife. <laughs> but yeah. It's so true. And it's, that's the thing. Sometimes people beat themselves up because they, they question if they're saved if they're having a, a hard time or a rough day. Mm -hmm. It's like, look, that's not your salvation We're, like, as far as you going to heaven. We're not dealing with that. This is just you growing up in Christ. That's the thing. That's the thing you're, you're struggling with. And the devil will come and say, ah, look, you swore it's so-and-so. You're not even saved. You're going to hell. <laughs> it's like, no, no. <laughs> That's not the thing that sent you to hell. Not believing in Jesus is what sent you to hell. Right? So there's one sin that people go to hell for, and it's not because they cursed their grandpa. It's because they didn't believe in what Jesus did for them. Right? But yeah, and that's it. Now it's that process. And this is the this is where, as the body of Christ, when we get together, this can go faster. Right? When we're doing this, or if we're having you know multiple meetings on Sunday, and we're let's let's do more. You know, the sanctification goes, it doesn't have to be like 20 years. No way. You know, it can happen in, in a short amount of time. It's really just up to how much of your will you're turning over to the Lord. So, oh, Lord, okay. You can have me all. Or have all of me, right? And he says, all right, let's do it. Let's, let's get it done. And then he'll just move through our life in wonderful ways. The danger, though, is if we're, say we have given ourselves completely to the Lord, then the devil says... You've done a wonderful job. <laughs> and tries to force us into a position before we're really, we've been tempered. You need to be tempered a bit, you know. Uh, and that's sort of like the call, we call it the calling, training, reigning thing. Like when David was anointed as king, he was 17 years old. You know, Samuel shows up, boom, okay, and he says, you're king, right? You're king. But God didn't put him in until he was king, officially, until he was 30. What was he doing for those 13 years? He was being trained. Right? God was working on him, dealing with all those character flaws, sorting them out. And he was running around in the wilderness, right? Being worked on. And that's it. So sometimes God will, you know, here you are, you get saved. Uh, God says, okay, I've got a call in your life. Or, you know, say like someone like George has a prophetic word over your life, and I see you going to the Congo. Brother, you're going to go to the Congo and save the natives in the Congo jungles. Hallelujah. And you go, okay, I'm a missionary. You're buying tickets to the Congo. You know? <laughs> no. <laughs> it doesn't, it, you will get there, but let God work that in you a little more, and then go, right? And then go. But sometimes people will have, they hear these words, and they just want to, like, fulfill it completely. But remember, even in that, it's God working with us. We're never just going to, I'm just going to do it and make myself holy. Then it becomes a dead thing, right? And maybe, maybe you are going to come. Hallelujah. Let's... <laughs> you never know. You never know. Uh, it would be actually pretty cool. But, uh, yeah. Any other questions or comments? <laughs> after yeah. my uh, salvation. Hey, sorry? After my salvation. Yes.
devil? See, well, all the devil made me do it. <laughs> you know, no, he, no one has a right to overcome your will. And see, the human will is like the most powerful thing in the universe. The fact that your will can send you to hell or send you to heaven. Because you decide, I'm going to believe Jesus or I'm going to believe the devil. Right? It's amazing. So yeah, you can completely, a lot of, the, even a lot of deliverance happens when people just hear the word. You know, they just hear, hear the truth, and then they've been, say, believing a lie about themselves, and, and then they hear that truth that God says, and says, no, I'm not, I'm not going to believe that anymore. And the will, you decide, no, nope, I'm believing what God says, right? And yeah, that, that's so awesome. That's so awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But fear is a big one. Yeah. Fear is a big one. That's such a huge thing. Forgiveness, <clears throat> it's almost like a, like, I like how you describe it, it is like, a, like being tied to a chain in the past, though. Right? You're trying to move on in the future. It's something somebody did 10 years ago 
is still keeping you chained to this. You know, God, why am I not able to go into the things? It's like, you gotta let go. That person's moved on. And that's usually how somebody offends us, and they move on. And we just, oh, can't believe they did that. It's like, you're holding on to this. They don't even care. <laughs> They're God, you know, and you're holding on to it. And it's keeping us from moving on in the things of God. It's like, just let go, let go. And that's, that's, that's the secret, right, is that forgiveness. Because, like, even Jesus on the cross, he's, he didn't get hung up on this, being offended by them crucifying him illegally. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. What a thing. I'd be like, God, kill him. <laughs> right? I'm up here for no reason. I was doing good. I'm healing their sick. I'm raising their dead. They put me up here. Daddy, let's just do them all. That's why I'm not God. <laughs> That's why Jesus did it. You know? Because it's like, what a thing though. Father, forgive him. Even in that place, he held no offense. Acts. But that's just pure love. Love doesn't, it just absorbs offenses like it's like a, its own child. You know, it doesn't matter. I love you. You don't know what you're doing, you said, guy. You're crucifying me. You have no clue I'm God. But I'll just love you anyway. That's amazing. That's amazing. Wow. 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 Yeah. 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 Anything else? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, question about anything at all? Any question to do with the Bible at all? Anything at all? Now you can think of one for next week. Okay, I've got this. We'll end up with any question at all. Who was, you know, where did Cain's wife come from? I was going to there and where's Cain? I'll let you know from her parents. What did George say? Was it George or James? Uh, or James? James was looking at it. Hey, Aaron, did, uh, did Adam have a belly button or something? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Maybe one, one of these days we'll have to try. You know, in Acts where Paul preached till like midnight and the guy fell out of the window because he was so tired. We'll have to try one of those. See if we can go to midnight. <laughs> yeah. Is this still recording? Oh, yeah, it is. It's okay. <laughs> I'll, I, I'll cut that off. Yeah. 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 Well, there's, yeah, we can, I can share a little more. <laughs> I can share something here. We can just tag. Well, okay, those of you who don't run out. Okay, let's just tag something on this then. Okay, so there's, there's three baptisms, okay? So when you're, uh, let's go, okay, let's, why not, let's look at it. First Corinthians 12, 13, we'll look at three more verses. <laughs> yeah, that's Evelyn's fault. First Corinthians? Yeah, First Corinthians 12, 13. say, oh, we're members of the body of Christ. How did you get into the body of Christ? This is the verse that actually tells you how you got into the body of Christ. Yeah. 
it says, For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have all been made to drink into one Spirit. So <coughs> you were baptized, meaning basically like you go into water, the Holy Spirit puts you in the body of Christ. Boom. Right? So, th and that's this. Right, so that happened in your spirit, your place, because obviously this thing, this flesh that came from mom and dad, isn't the body of Christ, you know, it's, that's our body, it's the body of Aaron, <laughs> right, so, and, but we are not just bodies, we are spirit, soul, and body, so our spirit, we're one spirit with the Lord, that's why we can all be one, have, we're not in our bodies, not in our souls, that's our identities, but in our spirit. All of our spirits are joined to the Lord, so that's why we're all one. In our spirit. So, in our spirit, we are baptized into the body of Christ. Right? Baptized into the body of Christ. So, let's see. Let's put that here. Baptized. Baptized into the body of... I'm trying to write like my 10th grade science teacher who had the worst writing in the world. <laughs> Baptized into the body of Christ. That's how Dr. Strike. Yeah, 1 Corinthians 12, I know, right? 12, 13. So if you get the wrong prescription, it's not their fault. I don't know. Good luck. 1 <laughs> Corinthians, so yeah. You're baptized in the body of Christ. Now, we know of another baptism, right? Let's go to Luke 3.16. Luke 3.16. You know John 3.16. Well, this is Luke 3.16. Luke 3.16. And this is actually good to know where it is. So when you're baptized in the body of Christ, that's your spirit. Becomes part of the body of Christ. Now, Luke 3.16, this is concerning your soul. And that's why this is cool. Luke 3.16, it's John the Baptist saying, John answered, saying unto them all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I cometh, the latch of whose shoes I'm not worthy to unloose, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. So here we have the baptism of... <laughs> Oh, this is awful. <laughs> it looks like someone had a two-year-old in here. Uh, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. So your spirit's baptized into the body of Christ, but there's a baptism for your soul. We're all familiar with the body one. We, you know, but the baptism for the soul is the baptism of the Holy Ghost, and it's it's cool. Jesus does it. Jesus baptizes with the Holy Ghost. So if people are seeking the baptism, it's going to be Jesus himself baptizing you with the Holy Ghost. Jesus baptizes you with the Holy Ghost. And that's your soul. Luke 3.16? Yeah, Luke 3.16. And that is your soul. We'll look at a, another scripture for that as well. Because ultimately, right, and this is, this is why you can see, uh, like in Corinthians... Uh, that church, they were very carnal, they were in sin, yet the gifts of the Spirit are moving like crazy. Right? And Paul's writing to them saying, guys, there's all kinds of weird sin going on, and yet he still has to instruct them how the gifts of the Spirit work. Because once you have the baptism of the Holy Ghost, what happens is the power of the Spirit can move through your soul very easily, even though you're immature. Right? Because it's not moving through your growth, it's moving through the baptism of the Holy Ghost. So we can, we'll look at that more in a sec. So we've got our baptized in the body of Christ and the Spirit, our soul, we're baptized with the Holy Ghost, that's when you're speaking in tongues, and gifts of the Spirit are moving there. Um, then obviously we know the water one. Uh, go to Acts 8.38. Acts 8.38. I'll read from 
verse uh, 35, as you're turning there, that Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here's water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Right? What's hindering me from baptism? Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And I'll read verse 39. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, but the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. So there we have the third baptism, right? We've got one for spirit, soul, and body. We're very familiar with the body one. Just getting baptized in the water by God's ministry and God's people. Now there's nothing magical about water baptism. Don't make it magical. People make it weird. It's just you're getting baptized in water. It's, it's an act of obedience. Right? You're just obeying the Lord. He got baptized. It's what we do. We get baptized. If we make it like the water has supernatural power, some people teach that unless you're baptized, you're not saved. But why do we know that's not true? Because it's over here with the Bible. <laughs> water baptism does not baptize your spirit. <laughs> right? That just that, that deals with the body. This baptism of the Holy Ghost deals with the soul. And then being baptized into the body of Christ. That's what deals with the spirit. Basically your salvation. You're going to heaven, you're being born again, you're in the family of God. Being baptized in water, that's not a salvation thing. It's some people teach it like it is. The Bible doesn't teach it like it is. So we have to be real careful with that. Because they teach like water, it becomes sort of this mystical thing. Because look, if people are in prison. They're not getting baptized in water, yet they can still get saved. So if water baptism is necessary for salvation, there's guys in prison who they believe in Jesus, but they didn't get in the water because they were on death row or whatever, and they're still in heaven. You know? So it's, we have to be real careful with anything that adds to what Jesus did. Right? It was like, oh, I believe in Jesus did this, but I also believe I get in the water. So we say Jesus wasn't enough, because that's what we are saying. We're saying, yes, it's not, he's not enough. It's also me getting in the lake. No. <laughs> you, your act of obedience is good. It's not salvation. When Jesus is in salvation, you're just obeying him. Just like with, right, Naaman, the Syrian. Just go dip in the water. It's, it's, God does these things just to see if we'll obey. Right? Do we have a heart of obedience or are we rebellious? So, eh, no. I don't want to. You know? It's just, we have to, we just obey. It's just an act of obedience. So we see those, those three things. Um, so yeah, spirit into the body of Christ, soul baptized with the Holy Ghost, and our body in water. Yeah. A little more. <laughs> Just a little more. <laughs> we, can go, we can go all night. <laughs> we can go all night. Here, I'll do one more. Just to, just, just to line it up. So... Um, and we'll use this when we're, let's just do it like, you know when we're believing for something? Like, okay, there's a promise, like, uh, for example, maybe we're believing for our needs to be met financially. And we, Philippians 4.19, my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus, right? So we go, okay, God, you know what we need, your word says this, so we're believing you'd supply, da 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 da, -da right? <coughs> and so, we want to know if we're in faith. We talked about this before, right? But not from this position. I want to know, am I actually believing? Am I in faith, right? So if we're in faith, that it's coming from here, right? It's coming from our spirit, right? That's pure, perfect faith, because that's the faith of Jesus. So let me find a spot. I'll just do it here. So you're going to be God conscious, right? <coughs> Right? So when we're believing, right, and it's it's our spiritual faith, it's a pure faith, it's genuine faith, you're just going to be conscious of God. Peter gets out of the boat, walking on water, and he's looking at Jesus, right? God conscious, looking at Jesus, conscious of that. Faith is working. It's victorious. <laughs> he's not sinking. You couldn't even push him down. There's nothing you can do to sink him as he's looking at Jesus. Right? 
what happens next? This one is self-conscious. And this one is world-conscious. World, you know the word. Okay. God, self, and world. So if we are believing, right, and we end up going, oh, I don't know if I can do this, I don't know if I have faith for this, you're not in the spirit. You, you, you know, it's not going to happen. As soon as you're having those thoughts, you can be like, okay, let's just shut it down and get reoriented here. It's, it's not happening. I'm just focused on me. Because our faith can't be on us. Right? It can't be in Aaron. You know? <laughs> like, if I'm believing God, I'm going, okay, uh, there's the promise. I just don't, I just don't think I can, oh, can I believe it? As soon as I am in that headspace, I just know what's not happening. Because I'm in the soul. You know? And now, the, once the soul is sanctified totally, you know, it's, it's filled in the word that I'm believing, then basically the spirit has annexed the soul, right? It's, we've brought the things of the spirit into the soul. But I'm not going to be self-conscious. I'm still going to be just conscious of God. Conscious of his word. I'm just going to be thinking of, no, God, your word says da 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 And that's fine. Our soul can completely submit to what the word says. And our soul can be just conscious of the Lord. Ultimately, that's what we want. And we see, with the body, it becomes world conscious. To be con it's, it's naturally, and God designed it like this, right? It's naturally conscious of what's around it. You know, if I bump into this, I'm aware it's, uh, that it's there. But in terms of faith, we see the problem is, Peter was walking on the water. He was here. And then his body, the eyes of his body, saw the wind and the waves. And then immediately, his body started to sink. And then what did he become? Self-conscious. Lord, save me. As he cried out. He realized, well, I'm going down. <laughs> in a major way. Right? In a storm at night. Like, there's no like nice lights. And I've been on that sea. Uh, not at night. But I've been out on it. And there's, just no, there's nothing there, even today, on the shoreline. You know? It would just be darkness. And so you're on the waves at night. Maybe there's some lightning that you've kind of seen the Lord on the water through. It'd be a pretty intense situation. But as long as you're looking at Jesus, that faith in us is just going to be victorious. So that's something we can train ourselves to, right? When we're going through something or you're praying for someone or dealing with a sickness in the family, you know, if we get to the spot where all we're doing is believing the doctor's report, right? The world, right? We're just conscious. The doctor said this, we're looking at it, and go, oh my goodness, oh God, oh we just got to pray, oh God, it's over. Forget your prayer. <laughs> I can tell you right now, your prayer is not faith prayer, it's not going to work. You know, if you're just sweating the doctor's report, <laughs> you have to get back to God's report, right? We have to go, okay, and this is just a way we can train ourselves. You know, we just, okay, we're going to turn ourselves back to God and get back to His report. And then, like you'll see, you'll see that peace will come, that rest will come, and you don't have to pretend either. Mm -hmm. Right? There's no, like, uh, trying to believe. You just believe or you don't believe. You know, we can all stand up, sit down on a chair. That's faith. Right? Did you, did you have to think about that chair? Oh, God. Oh, that chair is going to do it. <laughs> you know? It, like, you, when you just sit down on it, you, faith's already there. You just trust it. You know? When you, you go to your car and you turn the key, you don't for Oh, God, let this key ignite the engine. <laughs> you know? You just assume, I'm just going to turn the key, and right? You just do it. You just have... And that's, that is faith. You believe that when you turn the key, the engine's going to start. Right? And then when it doesn't, you go, there's a problem here. Yet when things don't work for Christians, we go, oh, it must not be God's will. It's funny, right? But when we know, is it, it's like we know the will of our car more than we know God's will. We know if I turn that key and the engine doesn't start, something's wrong. We don't blame, you know, God. That the, or, or we don't go, oh, I guess it's God's will that the car just sits here in the parking lot. We know it's not. Yet for our lives, we, we are unsure. Now, when we have the promises of God that says, this is how life can be with God, and something comes contrary, we need to treat it the same. No, 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 no. Take it to the mechanic. That's usually a pastor. 
<laughs> He's your mechanic, right? You take it to them, or the teacher, or the apostle, whatever it is, you know. Call George. We, we've got these people in the ministry that God's given us to say, Hey, my life's not lined up with the Word. What's wrong, Pastor? And he's supposed to be there to help. If he's not there to help, you've got to get rid of him. <laughs> it's just simple, all right? That's what they're there for. But we need to see, look, the Word says my life's supposed to be like this. I did that, and then it, we, should, we should expect it to work. If it's not, then we, we need to find that why. But in terms of, like, yeah, believing in faith, it, when you are believing, and this is why I always say, like, if you need faith, hear the Word preached. And if no one's preaching it to you, find it on CD and play it. And your faith will grow. It has to. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word. And then you'll just be hearing it and hearing it and hearing it. And you'll just believe it. Just so normal. You'll just believe it and do, start doing weird things with Jesus. And people will be like, what are you doing? And I just believe. You know? And then God will just use you mightily because you just believe, right? Now we don't try. If we're here, we're trying, right? We don't need to try to believe. Right? But as we get sanctified, as we grow, and as we mature, uh, then we start resting in what the truth is in our spirit. That he's doing it. And that's really it. You know, all the promises, whether it's provision or it's healing, it's already passed. It's past tense. He's already done it. Right? By whose stripes you were healed. He, you know, we're already healed. And all that. But, yeah. A little more. <laughs> <laughs>